We have got a fairly full agenda that we need to get through this morning. Um, I uh, just want to remind the board members that are here about their per diem forms, make sure the staff get those. Um, we've been here enough. I don't need to go over housekeeping as far as directions on how to find the boys and girls room so I can put it all set there. Um, this is a hybrid meeting, so um, we do have some board members uh, online um, uh, as well as obviously in the room. So, why don't we do introductions first, um, both at the table and board members online, um, and then the staff as well. And I'll begin. Uh, my name is Patrick Kelleher. I am the Commissioner of the Department of Marine Resources. Amanda Field, Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. I'm Roger Burley from Falmouth. Okay. I'm Phil Fallon. I'm a public member. Bob Meyer, public member from Bath. Jim Norris, public member from Winthrop. Barbara Trafton, public member from Brunswick. Great. Uh, board members are online. If you could introduce yourself. Judy, why don't you go first? Sure. Judy Camuso, Commissioner of Maine Fish and Wildlife. Good morning. It's Catherine Robbins Halstead, public member, Searsmont. And Mac Hunter, public member from Amherst. Great. Thank you. And let's, why don't we just do staff in the room? So, Sarah. Sarah DeMar is Director of the Land Community Institute Program. Laura Drury, LMF staff. Laura Graham, LMF staff. Jason Bulay, LMF staff. And why don't we just go around just to get everybody else? Uh, Jeff Romano, Main Coast Heritage Trust. Uh, Brianna Parisian, Bar La Boyd, Secretary Associate. Bethany Atkins, IFNW. Liz Petresca, BPL. Great, thank you. And I know we have a lot of other people online, um, and we will try to. Uh, if we do have any um, issues that will uh, deserve some additional discussion and we need to have some public input on it, I'll make sure I go to the public. It is online uh, and in the world. Um, we're going to go right down to the um, agenda here fairly quickly off the bat. Number Item number two is the minutes from the September 27th meeting, and we do need a motion to accept. Barbara. We accept the minutes as presented. So we have a motion for Barbara. I saw the hand from Jim. Uh, any questions, comments, concerns about the minutes from September? I will just note that uh, we did have one or two very minor corrections on um, who was present and all that, and we will make sure those get updated and posted to the website. Okay, so on, on the, so there is there's some mo small modifications, minor, 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 minor modifications about uh, attendees. Uh, nothing subject. That's great. Okay. Um, seeing none, are there any objections to accepting the minutes? Hearing no objections, uh, motion passes. We'll go on to item number three, which is money balances. So, Sarah. Okay, so we've got here um, your updated um, balances. You can see we are very close to spending down the 2009 bond funds. Um, we actually did have an expenditure um, for the farmland program, so that expenditure has gone down. That This was the... Um, uh, capital improvement grant um, that was approved by the board for um, Old Talbot Farm. So that number has gone down slightly, which is wonderful. And we're just waiting for our financial service center to um, do some journals and clear out that last uh, $1,900 on that one. I keep hoping that that's going to get done before the next board meeting and it hasn't quite yet, but they're on it. They know. Um, and then you'll see uh, the 2011 bond, we're continuing to spend that down, and we've um, made some um, some uh, expenditures out of the new funds as well. And I did want to just um, remind the board on water access funds. Um, we have $172,000 remaining from prior board allocations, so those will be from the 2011 bond. And then the new funds um, allocated two million dollars. So we haven't we haven't talked about it specifically in a while. So I thought it was just worthwhile to remind folks that we've got just over two million dollars there, ready and available for water access. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions for Sarah on balances? None. Let's move on to product allocation set. Okay, so this has been updated to show, reflect all of the work you've done in the past year. Uh, 37 active projects right now. 
Um, those are the allocations to the right in each of the categories. Uh, we did have a recent closing, Bucks Ledge, um, and we are expecting Mary Meeting Park, East Grand Weston, and potentially Caribou Street as well in the coming months before the next board meeting. Um, I think the only other thing to note is that the spreadsheet you got in your board packet had not been fully updated from the last meeting when we accepted farmland and, and working waterfront projects. So there's a replacement sheet there for you, which does include all of the projects. Uh, 37 projects. That's a reflection of a lot of hard work from partners, staff, and the board. So that's uh, that's a really good number to see. Um, any questions, Sarah, on project allocation? Seeing none, we're going to move right along then to um, item number four. Um, we've got two projects that we need to go through. Uh, the first is Fairbrook Preserve, and I believe Laura is taking this one. Yes, indeed. This is Fairbrook Preserve. And Sarah, I suppose I'll just use the, uh, oh, no, I'll let you do it. <laughs> so so uh, this is the Fairbrook Preserve. This is the Heron Colony, as you may recall. Uh, this is now IFNW's. Uh, IFNW is the DSA on this. This was a community certification uh, project. It is 145 plus or minus acres. It had, it had come in at 147 plus or minus. This is the correct acreage. Um, and the habitat's terribly important, and it does, it abuts the Libby Hill Forest Trail Network. It's expected to be extremely popular and well used, and it does protect that critical segment of snowmobile and ATV, ATV trails. Um, readiness. Okay, that word's not supposed to be in there. So uh, <laughs> just ignore that, please. <laughs> it, happens. it happens. It happens. <clears throat> The AOC met on October 25th uh, to talk about the appraisal. Um, this had been this had come with a yellow book appraisal as well. So there was both the appraisal and the review appraisal. The committee accepted the appraised value of $136,000. This is a, a pre-acquisition, uh, just so you so you know. So the committee did accept the appraised value of $136,000. And so we have a draft motion uh, to approve the AOC. Move to approve the recommendation of the LMF Appraisal Oversight Committee and accept the appraiser's value of $136,000. Second. Uh, it's actually a committee motion, so it does not need a second. Um, with that, it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a third. Right that. Uh, with, uh, with that in mind, is there any questions or comments on the project or the uh, motion to accept the recommendation? Seeing none at the table, seeing none on the screen. Is there any objections? Seeing no objections, the motion passes. And so we did announce public notice. It went out on November 19th uh, to the Kennebec Journal um, and to, let me see, is this one the one? No, this was just the Kennebec Journal. Um, and uh, this is and so we have a, se a second draft motion prepared to confirm the allocation of 65,000 in CNR funding. I'll move to confirm the allocation of $65,000 on LMF conservation and recreation funding to support the acquisition of standard conditions. We second. 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 Uh, so we've got a motion and a second. Uh, are there any uh, questions, comments, concerns around the motion? with regard to the allocation. Seeing not, are there any, uh, are there any object, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read the motion uh, for the record. Oh, I was gonna read the motion for the record. Um, uh, motion uh, is to confirm the allocation of 65,000 in LMF conservation and recreational funding to support the acquisition subject to standard conditions. Is there any objections to the motion that is on the board? Being no objections in the room or on the screen, the motion passes without objection. Thank you very much. Um, I do see that Alan, I was going to recall on you earlier, Alan, but if you uh, have a comment you'd like to make about the project uh, or any, any comments you'd like to make, that would be a good time. It's been a great project and thank you for your support. And uh, we'll be building the trailhead parking lot within a matter of weeks. So thank you. Excellent. Great. Perfect. 
Great. All right. Thank you very much. Um, let's move right along to item number six, which is the East Grand Western Conservation Project. And uh, we haven't heard Laura in a while. So, Laura, if you'd like Thanks. to. Thanks. Let me on a roll for a while. Just sit quietly. Right. That's right. So, um, this is the East Grand Western. This is that million dollar view that earned that single exceptional value. So rare. There it is. And, it, and these lands are the source of the view, not, not just something you see from the land. Um, a pretty, pretty special project. A uh, lot, a lot of CE acres to be acquired. Um, obviously, a project of statewide uh, significance. And it protects public access to so much water and so many rivers and trail systems and a watershed and scenic interest. It's got a little bit of everything going on. Um, yeah, absolutely fabulous project. The AOC met on November 15th to talk about the appraisal. <laughs> The appraisal uh, reported a value of four million dollars and four million twelve thousand dollars for the easement uh, value, um, and the committee accepted that appraised value of four million twelve thousand. I kept having to remind myself the easement value, not because the, the estimated value when it came in was six million. The anyway, the easement value is four million twelve thousand. We have prepared a draft motion. I move to approve the recommendation of the LMF Appraisal Oversight Committee and accept the appraiser's value of four million twelve thousand dollars for the conservation easement. We have a uh, motion on the board. A committee motion does not need a second. Uh, are there any questions on the on the motion? Yep. No, no questions. But I think it's important that the whole board realize how difficult, complex the appraisal was for our little group. But you know, before values, after values, water, timber, uh, easement, you know, other complications. And um, it, I think it was quite a test for us. <laughs> but I don't uh, think anybody has any idea of how hard we work. On <laughs> well, tell us. You're putting it in a race. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it, it is. It was a very 235 pages and. Thank God for the staff's analysis and so forth. So, Shaw, thank you. <laughs> it's your analysis. Thank you. Have, uh, any questions from the board members uh, on the screen? I don't see any hands up um, and none in the room. Is there any objections to the motion? Read into the record quickly. This motion is to approve the recommendation of the LMF Appraisal Oversight Committee and accept the appraised value of. Four million twelve thousand dollars for the conservation easement. Um, uh, are there any objections? The motion, seeing no objections, the motion passes. And so we did announce public notice. Uh, this one went into the Kennebec Journal and the Bangor Daily News on November nineteenth. There have been no comments received, so we created the draft motion for your consideration. Yes, I'd like to move to confirm the allocation of nine hundred ninety-five thousand in LMF conservation and recreational funding to support the acquisition, subject to standard conditions. Motion by Jim, second by Barbara. Um, any any questions uh, in regard to the question? Seeing no hands on the screen or in the room, is there any objections to the motion? Just read into the record for the final time just to confirm the allocation of 995,000 in LMF conservation and recreational funding to support the acquisition subject to standards and conditions. Final call for objections. Seeing no objections, the motion passes. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a heads up to Commissioner Beal. You'll be seeing that contract come your way very shortly. You're <laughs> <laughs> on the fast track. There you will. All right, um, so that um, we've breezed through the first six items very quickly. Um, this brings us into some areas where we'll certainly be having some discussion, I'm sure. And the next item is uh, agenda item number seven, which is board policy topics. And the first one is the LMF and our MRCP MOU. So, Laura, I understand your. That's me. That's me. And the rest uh, of the staff, we. <laughs> you'll hear, you'll hear it. Oh, they didn't know. Um, so that alphabet soup, LMF, MNRCP, MOU. Um, this uh, came out of uh, well, the most recent iteration came out of the March 22nd board meeting. 
uh, staff had identified uh, four major questions uh, and the board discussed those major questions at that meeting. Um, the, uh, first of all, determining its relationship to mitigation funds, then MNRCP's acceptance of our program emphases like public access hunting, and the mutual willingness between our two programs to adapt our project agreements to, uh, to harmonize. And then the identification of a mutually acceptable designee as an enforcement alternative, um, likely the DSA. So that's the build up to all of this. And then this, you may recall this, this decision tree, this wiggly decision tree um, to help answer the first question, what's the board's relationship to um, mitigation funds? The more the board can use this, the board, I don't think they've, you've officially committed that you will use this, but this is a tool that you can use. And, and, and it was in response to um, wanting to be sure the MNRCP was not knocked out of the running at the get-go, because yes, they're mitigation funds, but if you follow these, this trail up and down, you find out, okay, yes, but if there's additional, if there are additional resource values that can be protected with LMF involvement, then you, you're, you're definitely wanting to be interested was the takeaway we had from Yield. This is a thing that would be important to you. So this is just to remind you that first question, a way you might answer that first question um, that allows us to continue to partner with MNRCP while protecting the impact of LMF funding. Okay. And so this, the second question was for MNRCP, you know, how, how they feel on any given project. Is, is it going to be not answering their program objectives? So the third and the fourth question were, um, are more about how we might adapt what sort of the MOU, how we might uh, give notice to each other, how we might protect each other's interests. And so these were the these are the sort of the major terms of the MOU. Um, we're, 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 we're committing in the MOU to be thoughtful and to be protective of each program's goals and to amend our project agreements to further that aim. And, and there's a before and after. If we find out that we'll be partnering on a project before there's a project agreement signed, we commit to using a project agreement that's modified in the way you saw in your packet with some, some, some changes. You'll see more about that. And if we find out after the fact, then we realize we can't really require applicants to sign a new project agreement, but we'll use our best efforts to get them to agree to sign a new, a revised project agreement to take into account the uh, the nature of the partnership. Um, so if there's any questions about that, we'll get right to the meat of the PA pieces. And so the project agreements, this is the sort of how the project agreements marked up in your packet, really the major mm -hmm. points where we acknowledge each other in the cost section, we update our notice provisions, we modify some procedures on dissolution, and we really highlight the nature of the partnership. Um, and we undertook together, this was all reached with in, in consultation, obviously with MNRCP administrative staff, with the AG's office and with the MNRCP's, uh, TNC's private counsel. This was all worked out in a consensus uh, manner. And um, their project agreement is also modified to reflect some of these changes. Um, so I, I guess that's, Kind of it. The particulars are in your actual packet. I left the red line version of the project agreement in, in the packet so you could see exactly what we would propose to change. Questions about that? I think you answered my question in your description, but so, you, so the AG's office was engaged in this. The AG's office didn't raise any red flags. The only thing the AG's office asked us to do um, that I recall was make sure you identify your authority for doing yeah. this. So in the MOU, we talk about your rulemaking ability and our sort of our, our collaboration. So we addressed that in the MOU and then the AG was perfectly happy. Yeah, yeah, okay. Perfect. And we had both um, the AG who uh, works with DEP and with LMF. So we had multiple minds thinking about it, yeah. thinking through from each party's perspective. Yeah, doesn't, it doesn't modify our authorities at all. I mean, that's where I would have, why I was thinking about the AG's office, because I run exactly. through that a lot with them. So. Exactly. That was her first, like, hey, where you get, say where you get the authority to do this. Yeah. Go. It's, it's probably worth noting that there was an attorney on behalf of the 
Nature Conservancy and the Mitigation Fund. So we had yeah. a lot of lawyers. A lot of lawyers. And, and they worked really well. They were very they collaborative. Well together. And, yeah, got, it, got us through. All very, very collaborative. And so I think this is this. The next slide is um, the one I just added this morning because I realized after all this, I forgot to create one more. Um, yeah, yeah, the draft motion. Like, oh yeah, there's an action <laughs> item here. <laughs> if you are willing to to do this, this would be our recommendation. Well, we approve the signing of MOU between LMF and and RC and suggested changes to the project agreement as offered. So, so before we before we have a second on this, um, it's a little kind of out of the ordinary to have a motion on something like this. I mean, we don't recall doing things like this. And so we're approving the signing, but we don't have the MOU. We do. We, it was so the MOU is in the. Okay, yeah, and yeah, I yeah. missed the MOU. Yeah. My apologies. It's so, short. Lincoln, you miss it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, disregard my comment then. So we have a motion by uh, Mr. Burley. We have a second. Second. Second by Robert Trafton. Uh, any questions or comments on the motion? Kim. Yes. Who are the key players in the for the MNRCP? That is. Just, Great question, Sarah. Correct me if I get this wrong. Okay, so there's certainly TNC, right? It's the major administrator. And then DEP is heavily involved. They're the ones that do the in lieu fee program, right? And there's Army Corps, but they're not very, they're very peripherally involved. And nobody thought they actually needed to be consulted or addressed in the project agreement itself. But that has been delegated to TNC. DEP. So, and, D, and DEP they, was. They the, delegate to DEP. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. I knew I wouldn't. And so with DEP and TNC, we were all confident we had all the players. Thank you. Um, congratulations. This represents a lot of work really over the last three years. Um, you may recall that um, I surfaced this because Bucky Owen had been frustrated, he was on the board of the Orono Land Trust, which is an all-volunteer land trust, and they had some MNRCP funds, and it's hard for them to raise money as an all-volunteer group, but they weren't allowed to use those funds. It was very frustrating for him. Um, what I wonder is if you, in the course of doing all this, had, had any sense how often ah. uh, this may be used you know, going forward. This, I'm so glad you asked that, Barbara. Um, what was very, very abundantly clear to all of us eventually was how rarely this will be a good fit for both programs. Um, our emphasis, our priorities are different, not diametrically opposed, but very different. And so those instances in which a project will be an excellent candidate for MNRCP funding, while simultaneously being great for LMF, are, are going to be, they're not going to be very many of them. But when they are, it's nice to know we can play well together. Um, yeah, we have one right now that's in both. We have the Johnson Brooks disc is both. We were just yeah. awarded MNRCP funds yeah. this last week. Okay. So yeah, we'll so it's not never. Yeah. yeah, great. Yeah, and we feel obviously it's better to be prepared in advance than be like scrambling on an ad hoc basis. What do we do? Which we would never do. So, <laughs> thank you for that question. It's very, very, very assuring. Uh, Commissioner Camuso. Thanks, Pat. I just wanted to uh, sort of elaborate on that a little bit as I sit on the MNRC board, uh, as do you and Commissioner Beale. But um, so MNRCP really prioritizes restoration of habitat over. Uh, <coughs> or preservation and they really don't uh, support a lot of habitat management so they're they're the two programs are i think compatible in very s s small areas um, um both very valuable programs but they are quite different in their approach to uh the way they operate yeah thanks for that clarification judy i think that's uh that's an important uh aspect of the program uh and shows the differences um any we've got a motion on the board any more questions 
Read into the record. Uh, the motion is to approve the signing of the memorandum of, memorandum of understanding between LMF and the MNRCP and the suggested changes to the project agreement offer. Are there any objections to the motion on the board? Seeing no objection on the screen and no objections in the room, the motion passes. Great. Can I ask a related question? But not. Oh, yes, please. Um, I was just wondering, um, Sarah, I know that there has been discussion about looking at the USDA ARE program and looking at compatibility and, and just wondering if there's been any more. There has not. Um, <clears throat> had some initial conversations with Susan and have it, has it moved forward since then? Yeah. Um, is it still possible to, I, I know we talked about a template that would be approved. Is that? That would be the, that would be the objective. Yeah, for sure. It, yeah. I think, yeah, just hasn't risen yeah. yet. Yeah. <laughs> I think that will be important going forward though. Um, yep. So just wanted to keep that on that radar. Okay, great. Um, so our next piece of uh, item number seven is the designated state agency roles, and that is there. Okay, so um, again, just some background context. This conversation started as a result of the um, process workgroup recommendations. Um, there was a recommendation to find opportunities to minimize long-term or perpetual obligations placed on DSAs while still ensuring program integrity. And um, staff, LMS staff, DSA staff, um, and the board have been working through these recommendations for the last, yeah, over a year, two years maybe. Um, so we brought, we worked through, we're able to get probably 75% of the way to consensus on some different um, process steps that state agency staff would take internally um, and are coming back to you with, with the 100% consensus um, decision. And this, again, is more to do with um, the roles of LMF and the roles of the DSA as described in the LMF project agreement. Um, IFNW and DACF commissioners have now reviewed those responsibilities um, and made the determination that um, in light of the agency personal expertise and legislative authority of their agencies to manage public land, that it's appropriate for the DSAs to maintain the responsibilities outlined in the project agreement. And there's a recognition that there's a need for additional capacity in order to, to continue to do that. So they have committed to pursue that additional capacity so that DSA staff can continue to um, provide um, assistance when there are discrepancies on boundary lines or there's a need to adjust a boundary line um, to approve fees assessed for the use of LMF funds to approve the sale or transfer of lands to another entity, which the board also has that authority to, to make that approval. Um, and the that the property can't be converted to other uses and to receive annual monitoring reports from cooperating entities. So status quo with additional capacity, hopefully. Commissioner Beal. Yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to also add that part of that discussion was talking about um, just making sure that all the roles are very clearly defined, um, particularly so that applicants feel like it's clear who they need to talk to for what, and it doesn't it doesn't feel like there's duplication. But just, you know, I think Commissioner Camuso and I really recognize that as we're approving more and more and more projects, it, it creates an ongoing, uh, you know, increasing workload for our staff, and there is a there's a limit to that with what we have. Oh. And uh, maybe I could ask both you, Commissioner Beal and Commissioner Camuso. So we talk about increasing capacity. Um, we're all aware, you know, one way that could be done through the, uh, the budget. Do um, you have any other options for increasing capacity or do you think that's likely that you know, so the LMF has increased capacity, and so I feel, I don't know 
I feel Sarah thinks we're pretty well staffed now at the LMF, but we haven't had any comparable upgrade in staffing for your agencies, which do a lot of work. So I just wonder what the future is there for. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we can make a really strong case that, you know, as we take on more work, we can't just keep keeping it on the same number of people. So um, I don't know what Commissioner Camuso is planning to do, but we are planning to put a request in for additional staffing. Uh, Jim, I've got uh, Commissioner Camuso's hand, and I'll come to you. Judy? No, I just wanted to clarify, um, similar to Commissioner Bio, we will, we will be putting in a request through the budget process for additional staff so that it's not guaranteed, but um, I think uh, as Commissioner Beale indicated, we can make a really good case for the need um, and the justification for that additional capacity. Yeah, and I would just say if we're not successful, we might kind of have to come back and have this conversation again in terms of workload and capacity. Yeah, will, will that request uh, include <clears throat> other responsibilities other than what's described here? It's, you know, your general needs outside of LMF working agreements and so forth? That's a great question. We haven't totally, you know, finalized what we're going to be requesting, so I can't answer that exactly right now. Any other questions on this particular topic? There's no board act. Oh, uh, Mac, as you can see your hand up. Just briefly, I want to uh, thank Commissioner, excuse me, Camuso and, and Beal first sticking their necks out on this one. It is appreciated. Thanks, thanks Matt. Uh, any, any other questions or comments? There's no board action on this, just an update on, uh, on really a capacity issue. Um, and I think, um, I think all of the agencies are, are starting to feel that with uh, expanded projects and uh, properties that we're holding. So um, I, I know the, in this particular case, the governor's obviously been very supportive of the LMF process, sees the benefits here. So um, I don't think the problem will be, it will be when we get to the third floor and what, how those discussions go. So. I would just add to Commissioner Beale's point, we've done a lot of work and we'll be going over some of that work later when we look at the workbook on how to um, try to clarify for our applicant community sort of who's doing what. So you'll see some of that reflected, some of that work reflected in the workbook. We, we also have a new inquiry form. Maybe that, that's, that's one of the that's things one you're example. talking about. Yep, that, exactly. Uh, I don't know if either Bethany or Liz want to comment, but I, I think that's an attempt to reduce your workload. I hope it doesn't um, <laughs> add a whole nother step. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And we we will talk about that. Yep. yep. Um, I, the only other part um, for this discussion is um, there were some additional next steps. Uh, one of those in response to the DSA is kind of saying we 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 need some help here. <laughs> we need some help. Um, part of the next steps is to look at the project agreement. There is one provision which um, gives the DSAs the sole authority to cure any defaults on the LMF project agreement, and it lays out what those what those options are to to cure a, a default. And we are going to look at um, sort of sharing that responsibility among the DSA staff and the board, so that the board has. Um, some responsibility in making sure that those any issues in the future are adequately dealt with. And that felt like a very fair <laughs> ask from the board. The when you said board, you meant those <laughs> <ones. laughs> uh, we uh, as long as I am director, we will continue the process of bringing you some options to discuss and um, <laughs> We, we delegate. No, <laughs> we, do. we do our best to give you good options. <laughs> the other um, next step is to work with the DSA staff on looking at the annual um, reporting form that goes out to our cooperating entities. And just, you know, are there are there questions that we're not asking that we should be asking? Or is there a way to organize information in a way that makes it easier for the DSAs to complete 
the responsibilities of, of uh, receiving annual monitoring reports. So some additional work we can do to um, help uh, create some efficiencies. Good. Any other questions? Seeing none, so we'll have a little bit more homework to do on this uh, at a later date. Uh, so this will, those next steps, those conversations will come back to you. So why don't we move on to the last uh, sub item under number seven, which is stewardship funds and Jason gets to talk. All right. All right. Who's on this time? <laughs> I, I think we skipped one before we move on that I really want to make sure we talk about. Um, this is back to the DSA role. Sorry, Pat. We got ahead of ourselves. Yes. Um, the, a couple of other next steps regarding our project agreements. Um, LMF and DSA staff will develop template language for the project agreement regarding property use and management, which we um, will have the AG's office review and that would then get incorporated into our project agreement. Again, these are just steps that are intended to create some efficiencies and streamlining. And then there was the potential um, of looking at creating a joint LMF and DSA panel to review amendment and change of use requests with a goal of creating clarity and consistency in state review and recommendations to the LMF board. So. Um, currently, the DSA, when an applicant wants to put a ballpark a tennis court on their LMF funded property, that goes to the DSA and the DSA is responsible for reviewing that request and bringing a recommendation to the board. So this would um, spread that workload, not just be um, so heavily focused on the DSAs, but also um, with LMF staff and um, making that a more joint process. In that way, yeah. I mean, in a sense, it's what how it works now, right? I, mean, I would agree. Yeah, I mean, so this, it's not a big change, it's just formalizing. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Now, right. now we can move on. All right, now let's talk. Let's let Jason. <laughs> Stewardship funds. So, as I'm sure everybody remembers, yes. <laughs> last year the legislature for the first time gave you all the authority to award funds for stewardship endowments uh, instead of just the acquisition of land. Uh, there is the statute. I'm not going to break it down yet again. Uh, but the way we got here is it last March, LMS staff shared a draft policy with you all. And following that discussion, we convened a stewardship work group of board members and uh, land trust folks and had a very wide range, wide ranging conversation about what this policy needed to include. Uh, got to consensus on many things. Um, but, pop, but as a follow up to that, we also needed to do some consultation with some other state agencies, which we have done and gotten much more clarity on what we can and can't do. And all of that is uh, consolidated into a draft policy that was in the board packet. Um, I try, tried to note where the where there was consensus and where we still needed some policy discussions, but everything in there is open for discussion by the full board and Barbara has informed me that there is that she would like to uh, have a policy discussion about match uh, on a topic that where I had thought there was consensus, um, which may just go say, say more about my memory of this process than anything else. Uh, so uh, let's dive into the uh, first topic that needs board uh, this board action, which is the amount of the award. Uh, we have, the board had, had approved a five percent set aside of five percent of the LMF award uh, as a matter of was, and the board has not approved that as being the amount of the stewardship award, but just as a set aside for bookkeeping purposes at this stage. Um, and those would for round 10, those would range from 2375 on the smallest smallest award, which was CISC, up to almost 100,000 on uh, the larger projects. And I think there were half a dozen or so that were up above 50,000 or around 50,000 uh, in that, which was a total eligibility of just over 700,000 if that were the award amount. The discussion in the work group was that 
first first that those awards for the smaller projects were too small to be a meaningful contribution to the long term stewardship of those of those smaller projects. Um, and um, also <coughs> that the larger ones were were um, result just resulting in tying up a lot of LMF funds in these awards. So that there was a desire to have something that started high and then tapered off so that there was so that we weren't eating way into the funds available for acquisitions. So following that meeting, uh, we put together a formula of 5% of the first $200,000 of appraised value rather than LMF award. That is the statutory maximum for those um, projects up to $200,000 in value. And then 2% of appraised value above $200,000 up to a cap of 25,000, which keeps the total awards in check. Um, and the, the reason, one of the reasons for going to appraised value rather than LMF award for this is to make it fair to all projects, regardless of how much match they were bringing to the table. For instance, uh, Tondro, the LMF award was 200 and something thousand, but the appraised value was over a million. So they if it was based on the award, they would have had a, a fairly small eligibility for uh, stewardship funds. Uh, so with this formula, the set of, that would bring this, the lowest one up to almost 5,000, and then 11 projects would be capped at the 25,000 amount, and the total would be 541,000. So it would actually uh, increase the, the amount of it available to fund additional acquisitions. So this formula is it's like it was developed after that meeting it was shared and shared to the work group by email there there was the, the, the people who responded they responded favorably but i wouldn't call it a consensus let's put it that way <laughs> yeah I, I, we didn't hear negative comments right but what so that is there uh for any further discussion that the board wants to then Jason provided at the end of attachment g a table that kind of shows some different options that were considered and sort of what impact they would have um, for the projects, but also to available funds for, for additional projects. So you, it was a it was a thoughtful, robust process. We came up with was uh, what we felt was uh, valuable to the applicant community and responsive to the concerns about having not tying up too much money tenor of the negative commentary? Uh, Jason, do you remember? I don't really, I, I wouldn't say it was negative commentary. It was um, uh, Construct, constructive or, or more um, sort of how, how do we ensure that um, LMF's contribution is meaningful and consistent with what <clears throat> land trusts are already doing with their stewardship endowments, I would say. So so making sure that whatever we're doing is additive in a positive way and not complicated. Would you agree, Barbara? Yeah, Jason? I don't I, I wouldn't use the word negative. I think yeah. really we were trying to particularly help smaller entities because as I think we all know, yeah. the big guys yeah. and gals have robust stewardship programs. But as you remember, when we were doing our scoring, Little Woodstock had no stewardship program. And so if you win on the assessed value, you know, you're creating a fund. If you don't put enough in the fund, it can't generate any income for stewardship. So going with the appraised value, I think, really helped those smaller projects, some of whom don't have any stewardship program at this point may rely on an annual appropriation at a town meeting, yep. which could be dicey. Thanks. Jim, I'm real proud of the way this this panned out and thank thank the folks who worked hard on it. It really shows some thought. additional comments from the board um, since this is a strong connection to our uh, our partners uh, out in the field in the community is there any comments from uh, 
from the public on this particular issue? Let's see any hands uh, online or in the room. Uh, Commissioner Camuso. Your screen Thanks. has gone. Your screen has gone black here, Judy. I don't know if you're. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. That's weird. I can see myself. <laughs> oh, Welcome to you. As long as we it can see good. your hand. I, we have a vote. I'll have to have you do a voice. Huh. Can you see me now? Let me shut down. I think I might well, have to. Hey, hey, uh, hey. You see you. Um, so I, I think it's a really good. Um, approach and my my comment and I, I like the um, allocation based on the appraisal, not just the LMF award. My my comment is actually um, in the use of the funds. So under on page we're two gonna, of the, you're gonna get to that later. Yeah we're we yeah. Okay. We, I'll hold off then. We can we can jump to that though. What whatever whatever works for you. Why don't we just why don't we go through the slide and hold Judy hold your yeah. comment. We'll okay. go through the slides and then we'll come back to comment. So, okay. The next item where there was not uh, quite a consensus on the work group was in terms of what restrictions the LMF board should put on the principal on these awards. Uh, there was some the discussion was was whether we essentially say that the all the, the, the principal must be entirely retained and only the only the interest spent or whether we use a more flexible policy. Um, after looking at some different example policies, which took a variety of approaches, what we the staff recommends, and I think mo at least most of the of the work group members were coming from this position as well. Is uh, as a as a, a policy that they we just state that the funds must be held and managed as an endowment of perpetual dur duration in accordance with 13 MRS uh, 5101, and so on, which is a statute that governs uh, endowment accounts essentially. Uh, and also that there be uh, a, a policy that anything, any expenditure greater than 7% of the current value requires approval of the element. 7% is a threshold that's created in the statute. Uh, not saying that you can't, the statute doesn't say you can't spend beyond that, but it's a, it raises a flag in the statute. So that's what, that's the reason for that amount. Uh, and I'll, I would just add, um, this recommendation comes after conversations with the AG's office, the treasurer's office, the um, office of the state controllers office, um, if, so a lot of effort was put into getting um, some guidance um, and consensus from various folks. Um, and I gotta say our AG was very excited to delve into this. <laughs> I don't think we've gotten a call back from her as quickly as on any other topic. <laughs> Something different than I conservation easements and. <laughs> yeah. I also wanna say that one of the reasons for this approach is that the land trust community has the people who are going to be receiving these funds have given a lot of thought to managing these managing stewardship funds and endowments and have a really a variety of well thought out policies uh, that they're going to follow so by you by using this uh, this policy it gives them the freedom to follow their own policies um, you know with a with an appropriate level of uh, you know, of oversight from our end. <laughs> yeah. Pat. Okay, so what is Title 13? Uh, you know, I'm familiar with 10 and a number, but I've never oh, I've seen that before. I don't remember what all 13 is, but this the specific stat act is. Uh, it's a corporate. OK. I, I have a here. Too. This but 13 uh, and 5101 and the following sections are the. Uh, what is it? It's a it's a uniform statute for the for the management of institutional funds, okay. and specifically specifically governs how institutions should manage endowment funds. It's very very helpful and thorough. And and 
as Jason said, it's sort of a universal, so it's used and adopted by many, many states. Thank you. And, and I would just say. Hold on, Julia, Barbara, and then you. Uh, I would just say that there are a lot of protections built in here to protect what's called the historic value of the fund. So they don't use words like principal and interest in the same way that a layman might use them, but they do refer to protecting the historic value. And even if we give an exemption, there's still a notification requirement here if you're going to dip into the fund exactly. and it may do something to the historic value. So I think the committee felt that um, many, as you mentioned, Jason, many of the entities, the cooperating entities, have very robust stewardship programs, and they're, they have a financial manager who takes care of these funds. Uh, for example, Liz informed us along the way that BPL has all their funds with the community, main community foundation for investment purposes and things. So I think the committee felt that it was good to work within established main law that was already here and allow cooperating entities to have their own financial managers and uh, plans and policies. So I think this accomplishes it. And I don't know how often this exception would be used. And I would hope if there was an exception that Sarah would bring it to the board's attention, it would be very infrequently, I think that that would occur. But there would also, as I read it, would have to be a notification to the AG's office too. To does, follow up on that, Jim? Yes. Okay. Does this, there's no enforcement piece. This is like a template for everybody to use. I mean, nobody representing um, the management of institutional funds that's overseeing what everybody's doing and could take action to enforce some of these provisions out of it. Well, my, and I, I, I'm going to assume that there is a code of ethics that investment funders have to follow. And in terms of enforcement, my understanding through that is that the AG's office has standing. They that do. they have, yeah. Okay. Judy. Thanks, Pat. Um, my question is, is in the phrase it says expenditures in any year of an amount greater than seven percent of the fair market value um i'm questioning whether expenditure is the right word there uh sort of implies that the land trust can't actually spend more than seven percent um on any work they need to do i i think what you mean is that you can't withdraw more than seven percent of the endowment fund um but they could use other funds available to them so i i'm just not sure if that sentence is the way you want to phrase it does that make sense i yes i understand what you're saying I, and i think uh what would happen next is that there would be a um uh, a vehicle developed a document developed in turn that would explain the board's conditions um, associated with the stewardship funds, and that would get reviewed by the AG's office. So we would certainly make sure that the language was appropriate. Um, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. So it, are, are we thinking that some that a land trust would hold any LMF stewardship funds in a, its own endowment fund? Yes. Separate from any other separate. endowment fund. So, so what? The discussion that we had with Treasury is that yes, when we are when the board allocates funds for cooperating entities, the board is making a grant. As I said, there's a, a document, a vehicle to make those funds and the restrictions around those funds. An important thing to note is that um, Treasury made the determination that when state agencies are applying for these funds, they Treasury wants state funds, so LMF funds or state funds to be held at Treasury in their trust accounts. So that's the one difference. Yeah. Is that, and so is that explicit somewhere else besides here, or should it say fair fair uh, value of the LMF? So 
Oh, got it. Couple okay. thoughts. Yep. So the, the reason they need to be held in separate accounts is because by statute they have to be spent on this on the properties receiving LMF funding, and there's no way to accomplish that if they're not, you know, tracked as an as a separate account. Um, in terms of the, got where I was going. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that last that last question again? <laughs> Keeping monies in separate accounts. You well, were beginning to explain. I was now. yeah. I was just concerned that we make it explicit and we make it really clear oh. to anyone to keep these funds. Yeah, that they understand that yeah. that the LMF allocation has the certain rules and it right. doesn't necessarily affect the rest of the funds. Right, right. they're match funds. Well, so, it, yeah, so yeah, we, let's go to the next because we have to talk yes. about match funds. So, so let's but let's uh, say everything that we're saying here about the endowment applies to both the LMF mm -hmm. funds and the mat and the funds that are pledged as match for the LNF funds. For stewardship. For stewardship. So if if we award twenty five thousand dollars to you know a cooperating entity and they match that with twenty five thousand of their own money placed in a stewardship endowment, that has to be subject to, that's subject to all the same restrictions. So now but they if they have other stewardship funds or other other you know in a, in a separate stewardship investment account or an operating fund or whatever they can do whatever they want with those. Mr. Chair. Just a comment. Well, we did that on purpose. <laughs> there was a hole in the one. I would drop my comment. <laughs> um, can we go back to the last slide for one second? Um, one thing I know that we do with our, our endowment funds is it um, we're given kind of a grant distribution annually, which is at a certain percent. We might not spend that in a given year. And so um, again, when we get when you get to the actual vehicle, Sierra, I think it would be helpful to make sure that that can be carried over into a future year. Yeah. And so that may end up being more than 7% in a given year in terms of what's spent. But. Yep, we talked about that with Treasury too. Yeah, yep. great. The, the other thing that I... I was just going to mention, and Bethany, I, I mean, Liz, I thought you were going to ask about this. So you keep your funds in the Maine Community Foundation. So they have one big account, but they may have a fund for X property and then a fund for Y property and a fund for Z property. And then the Maine Communi Community Foundation for investment purposes can commingle the funds and invest them, but they're all kept straight in terms exactly. of which property they're meant for. And Sarah, are you saying that EPL wouldn't be allowed to continue that practice with funds that were allocated? Yeah, the, the difference is those funds are not actually ours. They're like they're they belong to the NGOs that set them up. Not state dollars. They're not actually state so, dollars. So, so we would have we, to you'll different. have to set up a different uh, Okay. Well, but we can we talk about this a little bit that those funds that were held by Maine Community Foundation, assuming that they were that the Maine Community Foundation had similar restrictions on on those funds, they would be eligible as matching funds for an award that was put in a Treasury Trust account from LMF. That's great. Yeah. Are we talking strictly uh, cash versus land, you know land that well, that's what again we, we yeah we need we need to this is another <laughs> issue. <laughs> okay, let's go go down okay. through it. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna start at the beginning. I know there are there are points in here that people are eager to discuss, but uh, these are the items that you know we we thought we had consensus. I thought we had consensus on. I was I was putting the slides together, and I'm wrong where I'm wrong. Uh, but in terms of timing, we are looking at these being these. Stewardship awards being inclu included in the initial LMF proposal, and then the funds being released at closing or within 30 days after, if the if the uh, recipient needs a little bit more time to line up their match. But in, within that time frame, not as a separate, you know, next year kind of award uh, mechanism for cooperating entities. It will go directly to them. State agencies will go to a treasury trust account. Uh, funds may be used 
or any basically anything that falls under the stewardship umbrella, but specific to the parcel receiving LMF funding. That last piece is in statute, so that's why that is there. Um, I remember Commissioner Camuso had a had wanted to discuss something about the use of funds, so I will stop here. No, I think we addressed my question, Jason. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, in terms of match, uh, there were two. I guess there were two things that were discussed. I had, and there was less consensus than I had thought. Uh, but like all like all LMF awards, these must these awards have to be matched one to one. And the question is whether is what is eligible as match. Uh, this the draft policy is in the packet was written to allow either excess acquisition match or the applicant putting fund, putting their own funds into the stewardship endowment. Uh, when I say excess acquisition match, I mean that you know if the pro if the property is worth five hundred thousand and we only contribute two hundred thousand, they're overmatched and re and that that excess would be would be allowed to match the stewardship award. And I think that's a the and so I think that's a policy decision for the board to make. Uh, I know Barbara has, has thoughts on that, so I will. <laughs> stop but that, what that doesn't do is put more cash in their stewardship endowment. It, right. It helps a um, cash poor applicant meet, meet their match requirements, but it does not in, increase their stewardship endowment. I mean, I'm uncomfortable with that. I mean, in, in terms of, you know, what it's really for, if they faced a, a serious legal challenge where they, they don't want to dispose of match property or try to uh, do some sort of division of the property to accomplish that. I guess that leaves me hanging. I, 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 don't, I don't think there's any right answer. I think it is just a decision that the board gets to make. Do we know what most land trusts set aside for stewardship? What is the norm? I would say some to none. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, even in all honesty, even with the match, it's likely to be short of what the property actually needs for permanent for permanent stewardship endowment. And I know that most land trusts prefer to have a pooled stewardship endowment that's not you know, it's restricted to use on a specific fund. So there's certainly the, a cert, I expect a lot of land trusts are going to end up in a situation where they have this endowment that's restricted to the LMF funded property and that's supplemented by their general stewardship fund. But in terms of amount, it's all over the place, yeah. Jim and then Barbara. Jeff, don't, isn't, doesn't the Land Trust Alliance have a big fund for all the, especially the major land, uh, land trust organizations like yours to pool those resources, kind of an insurance policy? Uh, there, there, is a, there is a policy that you can, you can um, join. I can, the name escapes me right Terra now. Firma. Terra Firma, yeah. Uh, which is more for legal defense kind of thing. So, That's legal defense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and the Land Trust Alliance has standards and practices that, that lays out what land trust should, should do in terms of um, setting aside money for stewardship in general. And if you're an accredited land trust, that's audited every every five years that you're you're setting appropriate amount of money aside to do your stewardship. And I would say, in my experience, we're seeing an increasing number of land trusts who are using um, either their own or um, a formula that's been used by another entity to, to create their estimate on their stewardship needs. I, I would say 10 years ago, very few land trusts were doing that. So it's becoming more of a standard practice of sort of like m making a, a, a informed, um, you know, request or an informed allocation for stewardship than it had been in the past. It's usually part of the, of the, of the budget that's established when we identify a, uh, Property X. It's not just the land acquisition that we're fundraising for. It's the land acquisition and whatever stewardship we think is associated with that property. So it's done upfront right from the beginning. 
Judy. Oh, I'm sorry, Barbara. I had by Barbara and then Judy. I'm sorry. Um, so I, I wanted to specifically talk about the committee's discussion around what could count as match, because <clears throat> at our last meeting, I thought we had some consensus that it should be funds that would be the match. Two reasons for that. One is commitment, you know, that the cooperating entity makes a commitment to stewardship and comes up with uh, the cash or the funds uh, either through fundraising at the time that it's fundraising for the initial purchase. They usually do it all together. Uh, the second is just to have a big enough fund to really generate some monies that can be used to take care of the property. So you'll reflect back and you'll see that we said a maximum contribution from LMF would be 25,000. So if the cooperating entity came up with 25,000, now you've got a corpus of 50,000. And generally speaking, investment advisors recommend between four and 5% as a allowance on an annual basis. So you're talking about $2,500 a year for stewardship. So I really think it's important that, you know, we ask for funds to be put in there because if you match with land, now we're talking about $1,250. And that really is not sufficient. I, I can see how, you know, larger land trusts, larger statewide organization, that's a kind of an easy thing because they're often matching like Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust. They had a lot of excess capacity. But it, to me, it really doesn't address the legislative intent here, which is to really inspire more stewardship and to create a fund. So when they set a match, this is dangerous always to read into legislative minds and intent. But I really think in their hearts, they thought we were creating a pool of monies that could then generate an allowance that had some validity in terms of what stewardship expenses were. So I. I, I feel that the committee in our last meeting came to that conclusion that it was more desirable to have funds matching LMF funds, both in terms of commitment and in terms of the practicality of generating enough monies that could actually do something in terms of stewardship. No, I think the practicality side of that's a really important one and the and the amount of money that would be available at the end of the year because it, that's what I've been concerned about all along. Is it really going to be enough or was is that from a state agency standpoint? If you are in who knows how I, I know how the Maine Community Foundation manages money and and the benefit that we get from them with our accounts, is Treasury going to do the same? Is twenty five thousand going into an account at Treasury if it's a state project? Is that going to benefit the agency as a whole? At the end of the day, from a stewardship perspective, I can see it going into another account if it's being held by a non-state agency um, into a bigger pool, benefiting the project and benefiting the stewardship needs. But I'm, I am concerned about. I, I know where Treasury is coming from because when we started this conversation, I went back and looked kind of those uh, of those requirements. So I, I can understand exactly why, if it's a state dollar, that it's going to be managed through the Treasury component. But it, it's too bad that it's not more holistic, like the approach that you are uh, explaining from a state agency standpoint, because I think it's going to tie it not so much DMR's hands, but BACF and, and IFNW um, on state projects. Um, IFNW currently has funds held at Treasury, so we could do more research on that. Would on be, that. Yeah, that would be interesting to know. That would be interesting to know. Judy, you've been patiently waiting. Yeah, so I mean, a couple of things. I have, I've got a couple of questions. Um, one, I was, uh, I was with Barbara on requiring a uh, match one to one in in the form of cash. Until then, I started thinking about how is the state agency going to do that. And so, um, you know, I don't know that most of our match sources would allow for us to put money into an endowment uh, mm -hmm. as a, a as an allowable use, say, of our federal money. So I would just have to think through that. But I'm I'm mostly curious as to if if 
who's going to take on the burden of monitoring these uh, stewardship endowments and um, ensuring that the funds are used appropriately? Does that go? Just is that responsibility fall to the DSA, to the LMF staff? Is it incorporated in part of the uh, annual monitoring report from the applicants? Um, so I'm just curious about that. And then uh, I'm happy to talk about our license, our lifetime license fund is held uh, in, in the treasury. So I can answer any questions in Barbara's right where we're statutorily only allowed to spend between three and 5% of that annually without per, per additional per, permission from the legislature. But Jason can answer the part about um, how how are we keeping track of this over over time? Post receipt obligations. Yes. <laughs> so uh, yes, annual reporting on balance and expenditures as part of the project agreement. Annual reporting for cooperating entities and in terms of funds held by Treasury, we can get that report without any great difficulty. Uh, and in terms of what that money was spent on, was it spent on this property? I think it's mostly going to be self-reported. Uh, and if there's any question that, any, that either LMF or DSA staff has uh, in any given year, we'll, we'll pick up the phone and ask. And this was, a, this was the requirement of that annual um, fund balance was something that Treasury was basically going to mandate. You, you must receive that. Um, they, they feel very strongly that we receive those annual reports. And because because it's uh, you know these because the funds need to be held separately, you know generating that report is should be trivial. Yes. Yeah, I have a question for Liz in regards to um, all the easements, it's EPL and state holds and all the monitoring activity and finding violations and how is it handled? Is there do you budget? for enforcement activities, or, or do it, you in fact have to reach out into some other form of funding to, if there was a major violation? For instance? Yeah, so we have our stewardship specialist is uh, funded through our um, public lands fund. So we have that position that's budgeted every year. And then we, we also budget for income from our stewardship endowments to offset those expenses. And the endowment funds, there's there's ample money there to both fund the position and if we end up in an, an enforcement um, situation to draw on those funds to support. That, that sounds well. great, but you know when I think about some small organizations and you know money tied up and uh, match tied up in real estate, and whatever, I, it seems like they fall flat. Your situation sounds great to me. Um, um, I would just put in a good word for the oversight that land trusts provide of their land, MCHT, Nature Conservancy. As, as I mentioned earlier, they have robust stewardship plans long before we got in the game here. We're kind of, we're coming in and I hope we can inspire, uh, particularly some of the small municipalities, Searsmont, you know, Woodstock, uh, some of the very small land trusts that haven't engaged. But you would be impressed with the kind of stewardship activities that are going on now. I think I see Liz nodding her head and Sarah, uh, you know, and, and the boards oversee these stewardship activities and oversee any stewardship funds they have. So I think, you know, with the annual report and everything and, and, you know, the uh, stewardship that the land trust provide. I think we can be assured that $2,500, if they even reached the max, would be well expended on stewardship. I served as a monitor for an organization and we had enforcement action easements and, you know, it, it was 10 times that. Oh, yeah. um, fortunately, it was a medium-sized organization, in my opinion. So I... You know, it, it grossly stripped out all the money that had been set aside, and that was 10%. 10, 10%. Uh, so I guess I 
we're a little player mm -hmm. and we hope that you know it leverages more it That's leverages right. more and that they continue to grow this fund and other funds that they have it inspires increased stewardship and it, it was also sort of uh, it felt like it was the right thing for the state to do mm -hmm. to, to help the land trust communities that are helping us to accomplish our goals you know it's really um yeah, it to me it, it that was that I think was part of the intent was to say thank you for taking this on and here's a little bit of help right. <laughs> right. in doing so. Um, uh, we've got Max hand up, and then I uh, do see a hand from the public up, and I want to take a few public comments on this. Um, it, it's clear to me that there's probably a little bit more massaging of, of it that needs to be done. Um, so. Uh, we'll take a few more comments and then table this for uh, a future board meeting as long as there's no objection. So, Mac, why don't you go ahead? I agree with what Barbara was saying about uh, the uh, from a land trust perspective and the idea of using cash in, instead of uh, uh, excess match in the in the property values. But I do wonder how this would play out with municipalities, and I can. Imagine that trying to raise money in a in the town warrant for uh, for an endowment might be might be quite a challenge. I, I, and I would also note that stewardship from the perspective of a town might look rather different than that from a land trust. Imagine a town that's got a uh, a, a small highway department that plows the town roads. Well, uh, plowing a, a couple parking lots for uh, uh, public reserve is is it's just a very different thing. So uh, just were to think about it from a town perspective here. I agree completely with you, Mac. The challenge is we have to document match. And um, there is a challenge in documenting the contribution of the town plow. Like that, that that's not something we we can accurately document from year to year. So Whatever uh, I was we do, suggesting that as a as a, a part of the match, I okay. was just arguing as part of the contribution, allowing a cash match. Maybe you know it is property value, and I, I'm just saying from the perspective of the how much uh, stewardship needs to happen and what it costs and how those costs are shared. It is also rather different for towns. Got it. Great, thanks, Mac. Um, I I do see one hand from the public online. Uh, I can't. Do you know who that is? I, I can see. Maybe. Hi, this is Lynette Bat. Excuse me, Lynette Bat with Trust for Public Land. Can you all hear me? We can, Lynette. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, great. Yeah, thanks so much. First, I just want to thank the board for even considering um, the stewardship funding amount. It's super important to projects and super helpful. I was the former conservation director of a regional land trust outside of Maine, um, so I'm keenly aware of stewardship costs and and kind of um, appreciate this conversation about the actual costs of annual stewardship and i just wanted to comment in in that regard our land trust and and what i saw as the standard among land trusts was to withdraw closer to two and a half to three percent um for the fund to to truly be non-wasting because you've got you know the the six to seven percent that the fund actually earns but then budgeting in three percent for inflation and then about a 1% management fee leaves you with 2 to 3% to to kind of reasonably spend year after year. Um so the fun, the, the amounts that we budgeted were to about 25,000 to 100,000 for a conservation easement and then anywhere from 100 to 250,000 for fee properties depending on what was was happening on that given property. So the so what I found being at, at this land trust for many years is that we constantly underestimated the true annual costs of average annual costs of stewardship plus the actual fund administration and management. So if you add on top of that, you know, reporting and, and fund administration, you know, those those costs do add up. Um, and and I know that this uh, this group um, LMF has an obligation to ensure that the funds are managed and and used appropriately and totally appreciate that to the extent that it can that that can be simplified as much as possible it became an administrative nightmare for us as a as a small regional land trust to manage multiple different funds across you know 
70 or, or, or 80 properties. So the extent that it can be pooled um, and have a, a simple reporting, but allow the, the pooled use of those funds, I think would be a, a super help, especially to those smaller land trusts. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Lynette. I appreciate those comments. Are there any other uh, members of the public who would like to comment on stewardship? I think there was something that came through in the chat while we were speaking, but I didn't, I couldn't read it from here. I think that was relevant. Anything in the chat, Jason? Let's see. A uh, question from Alan Stearns. Is the proposal that LMF stewardship funds be used solely for endowments, and may they be also be used for construction, such as trail bridges or parking lots? Um, what we're talking about for stewardship funds would be solely for endowments. However, we would continue to make access improvement grants that could be used for trails and parking lots. Yeah. Any, Jeff, you all set? Um, okay, well, we've, um, I think, uh, talked through all of these pieces. Clearly, some more work needs to be done. So I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, I think I won't appreciate the work that's been done by, by the group uh, and staff on pulling this together. And I know we table this for uh, discussion either at the, probably at the next board meeting. Okay. Can I just add quickly? Is there anything other than the source of matching funds that needs further work out of, in terms of a policy rather, rather than the implementation language that would go into a project agreement or something like that? I think I heard um, looking into how state agencies can steward, I don't want to use the word, where they can put their funds and what they can use for match uh, to see if there's any more flexibility in there. So I think a little research on that particular thing. And I guess one could even imagine a different you know, route yeah. for state agencies if it seems advisable. Yeah, I think um, you know, depending on the size of the project and how much money and if is it a cash match or is it not a cash match, I think would determine probably how an agency would want to move forward with that. I think um, I think looking but, at the, the state funds held in one place, but the match funds held in a separate place is a potential option that would yeah. give greater flexibility. Yeah. Yeah, so let's let's look at that and just any feedback you can get from Treasury on their performance. Um, maybe we could uh, that we want to call out Treasury, but we could compare it to some yeah. uh, to the main community foundation work as well. Uh, I, I know our funds that are managed through main community foundations. I do. It's fantastic. Okay. Um, Thank you. That, that was that was a very good discussion. Um, so now we are moving on to agenda item number eight, which is round 11 workbook. Uh, we'll be over the scoring committee recommendations and then the overview of those changes. Sarah, is that you? Laura is going to start this one. Oh, Laura. Oh, Laura, not Laura. No, no. <laughs> um, so a scoring committee made of LMF board members, LMF partners, and agency staff met on September 28th of this year to discuss the conservation and recreation scoring criteria. Um, the committee discussed, didn't discuss all the criteria in the round 10 workbook, but instead focused on priorities set by the board in your July meeting uh, by the LMF work group and um, items identified by staff. So on page 17 of the draft workbook, you'll find the recommendations made by this scoring committee. I'll go through them uh, here to sort of highlight some differences between the round 10 scoring criteria and uh, and what is being proposed in 11. Can I just ask you to pause? I can't see a damn thing on that screen. No. And the stuff here in the package is very small. Um, oh, could sorry. that be made bigger? Yeah, why don't you sit right up? Yeah. <laughs> no, I find it it's very fine too. Yeah. 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 I said that on behalf of the conversation. It's not for you at all. No, no, no. Like, I can see it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's a nice chair, right? Yeah. yeah. Wait, I, wait. Julie noted we got to a new uh, slide template. Yeah. So oh, that we will oh, look at that. Make sure. Yeah. 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 That's a little bit. Um, okay, lesson learned on the first. I had a thought about stewardship that might. Hold on, Judy. 
that might I might want to I just want to bring this up and Sarah tell me if the tell me if I'm if this is an issue. As we get ready to put this round 11 workbook out and start asking for proposals, do we want to to at least um, make a decision to that we are going to ask for stewardship uh, amount in their proposals? At this, every good to understand that this match question still needs to be answered. Yeah, let me sit on that while we talk about this, but we'll fold it into this conversation. Judy, you had a question, comments? Uh, no, I just wanted to uh, say that I have to leave for another meeting, unfortunately. So Bethany Atkins, um, I believe, is in the room with you, and so she'll will uh, handle any questions, concerns, feedback from uh, our perspective. She's giving you the thumbs up, Judy, so I guess she's not disagreeing with you publicly, so that's good. Thanks for the heads up, Judy. Okay, bye. Okay. Cool. Okay, so I'll go through the changes uh, recommended by the scoring committee here. I'll describe them, so uh, if you can't see the slides, I'll do my best to, to cover the changes. So the first <laughs> criteria that the committee focused on is accessibility. Um, as you may see on page 17 and beyond in the draft workbook, the structure of the accessibility criterion would remain the same under these new recommendations, but there have been some clarifications and also an increase in points available to projects that have documented access along the private way, right of way, or the like, um, and also a commitment to maintain that access. So there was a feeling from the committee that these projects with good vehicular access weren't receiving enough accessibility points. Next up, uh, the proximity criterion. There's some fairly substantial changes being recommended here. Um, the, the recommendation is to divide proximity into two sections for uh, ease of filling out the application and ease of scoring the application. These two subsections would be plan implementation. So how well does the project implement existing conservation and recreation planning? And then two, connectivity, how well is the proposal connected to existing consider plans? Next up, uh, major land assets and additional land assets. The committee is recommending doing away with the concept of major and additional land assets, and two new criteria would replace uh, the points that were previously tied to the MLA and ALA. The two new criteria would one be project need, which we're familiar with, but in this case, it wouldn't be tied to the major land asset. It would be a maximum 20 point um, criterion on its own. And then the second new criteria would be assets. And applicants could choose to either describe the multiple land assets their proposal possesses, and they these would be scored by the board using the same system you use to score additional land assets in previous rounds, uh, or the applicant could opt to uh, make the case that their proposal demonstrates a single exceptional value. And so this would be a 30 point all or nothing score. So once again, the applicant could either go for multiple land assets, which could be up to a maximum of 30 points, or they could opt for a single exceptional value um, all or nothing score. <laughs> Community and ec economic benefit, um, the committee recommended changing this to community and ec economic impact, and the point allocation would be uh, defined in the new recommendations, bringing in some recommendations from the main uh, Climate Council Equity Subcommittee. So those are some new, some concepts were brought in from round 10, or brought over from round 10, I should say, and then some new ideas brought in uh, as a result of the Climate Council's Equity Subcommittee. Project structure uh, would be changed to municipal support. The easement preference would be done away with in these recommendations and instead projects demonstrating substantial support from the municipality or county in which they are located would receive the most points. And I will note that there wasn't um, consensus on this change, and so this might be a good um, option for or good. This might be ripe for board discussion, I should say, but I'll, I can finish up the going on to the next slide. Oh, that's talk about these points. <laughs> Unless you'd like to talk about that municipal, but that change now. Let's go through. We'll come back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the bonus points, all bonus points um, would be increased to 10 points each. Public water supply, in addition to being bumped up from five to 10 points, the locations eligible for public water supply bonus points would be expanded. If you remember in round 10, it's a, it was a pretty um, rigid category. And so 
uh, using the main drinking water program areas mapped by the main drinking water program locations eligible for these points have increased or would increase if improved. Climate change adaptation, uh, there were some considerable changes there, LMF, in conjunction with the Open Space Institute and the Maine Natural Areas Program to add a total, well, to add two new subcategories to this criterion. So the three applicants would have the choice of choosing two of the following three subcategories, climate resilience, underrepresented geophysical settings, and a management commitment. The, if you notice, the climate resilience would be pretty similar to what you used in round 10 with a little bit more definition for how points would be allocated. Underrepresented geophysical settings would offer applicants a chance to um, earn points if they were conserving a, a setting that is underrepresented in Maine's conserved lands as it stands now. The idea there being that um, it's important to conserve all different land types, not uh, Currently, there are certain types of lands that are conserved more frequently than others. Um, and then lastly, the management commitment would be an opportunity for projects or proposals that uh, were willing to make a commitment to manage the, the property for carbon sequestration. And these uh, commitments would be captured in the project agreement. So applicants could choose two of the three there. And I should say that the main natural areas program pre-acquisition checklist would provide applicants and uh, LMF and the board with the information needed to determine if they qualified for, for one or two. So all of that info would be provided by MNAP to applicants. Um, no changes to deer wintering areas. And uh, last but not least, a new criterion in the bonus points category for community accessibility projects that um, connect population centers and conservation would be eligible for, for bonus points. So that wraps it, wraps it up for me, but I will just mention once again, the easement preference, there wasn't consensus there. And then also there was a complete consensus in uh, the climate change adaptation addition, specifically the management commitment piece. Uh, thank you, Flora. And before I, for comments or questions for the board, could you change the screen so I can see the other You can hear one or the other. You can see yeah. the words or the people. <laughs> Okay, any uh, questions or comments on the scoring committee recommendations? Before we dive into comments, I just want to say thank you to the committee members. It was a really good discussion. We covered a lot of ground, very thoughtful proposals, and a lot of dedicated effort. So um, you, you are being presented with um, something that occurred in a one-day workshop. Um, just a phenomenal amount of work. So thank you. Uh, Catherine, I see a hand. Yes, thank you. Um, the one comment I have, and I had already relayed my comments to Sarah prior to this, but um, on the easement preference, I would like to see that that is kept in um, because for three major reasons is that I think it's important to keep the land in the tax base. I also feel that if you're purchasing easements versus outright. Um, that's generally less expensive when you're just purchasing an easement, and that will be more bang for the buck for LMF to, for, to help other uh, future projects. And I also think that, you know, there's at some point we have to think of how much land does the state actually need to own? You know, and if you keep it in an easement, you're still keeping that in private ownership. Um, so for those three reasons, I would like to see still the preference for easements um, remain in to the workbook. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. So were, were those removed altogether, Laura? They were. That was the that was a work group. That, that was a work group recommendations. Any additional thoughts from the board on this particular topic? I know I have found easements and the benefits of scoring easements uh, in the past. I think there are certainly the benefits that, uh, that Catherine raised, um, especially as far as bang for the buck or something that I've always appreciated from a program programmatic standpoint. So um, any thoughts, comments, questions? Jim. The organization I belong to, another organization, Natural Resources, avoids easements now for a number of reasons, although I, 
I agree. Catherine made some pretty good arguments that it with some of the administration and the dealing with um, the landowners and and so forth that it's be, and you know having to charge prohibitive stewardship fees and and so forth. Uh, um, that organization does not promote the easement side as opposed to the outright contribution or bargain sale purchase. Thank you. I guess I would just note that the subcommittee really took to heart the consideration of um, property and how that may affect the tax rolls, and that's why they chose to focus the criteria on municipal support um, with the idea that if the municipality is providing support, they have sort of thought through the any potential implications that it may have to the tax base. So I just want to assure Catherine that your thoughts were heard and there was an attempt to find a way to make a compromise um, through the scoring criteria. And, and that's that's the compromise that they came up with. And that if folks want to look at that, that's on page 23, scoring criteria number 27 of the workbook. Amanda, did you have your hand up? Well, I, I'm just going to bring up something else. So okay. stay on that thread. Uh, Robert. Um, you know, if if you have a large parcel of land in the North Woods, and you know, I know through the Nature Conservancy, our work, we love easements. I I would just say that easement is not an option for many many cooperating entities. So you know, we have a new mandate around community conservation. You know, Wyndham can't take an easement. You know. Any of these properties, it's either fee acquisition or or nothing. So there's, you know, no choice involved here that I could do this by easement. It has to be a fee. And the other thing I would say is, over the years, I've been impressed with the number of entities who pay uh, a fee in lieu of taxes. So I know that you know through my work with the Nature Conservancy that this is common practice. So so the impact on the tax base. Uh, is is greatly minimized. Yeah. Um, I, I don't necessarily disagree with any of that. I my, I know my interest was not necessarily from a tax base, uh, more a little bit more broader. And I was thinking more about those larger parcels um, that are being protected with with easements. Um, but your points are well taken. As far as the smaller parcels, it's very hard to to deal with from a from a fee base. Uh, it's they're only being dealt with pretty much from a fee base standpoint. So. Um, any other questions or comments from the board on this, Bob? Um, my concern on taking the easements out of the mix is that it might limit some projects from happening. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just that's a very viable option uh, for a lot of private landowners. And if that's taken away, you know, what are we leaving on the table that we're not going to be able to have now? Oh, well, let's clarify. This yeah, doesn't. They can, they can they still do an easement. Yeah. Just what I'm they won't get the five points right. for being an easement, right. but they can get five points if they have municipal support. So, so that's five <laughs> points out of 140. Right. 50. 50. Yeah. So. But so, just so everyone's clear, please okay. still bring easement projects to Elements. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I mean, is, is there, just so we can move on here, is there interest in seeing? Um, points around easements remaining in the scoring criteria. Catherine, I think we've got our answer. Um, so let, let's uh, let's move on to the next question. I think, Amanda, you had the next. Yeah, well, I just was wondering, we had such a good, robust discussion about stewardship and the, the note there that there are considerable changes around the climate change piece. Um, I'm just wondering if I can put I don't know, Liz, or me on the spot, let's talk about from a stewardship perspective, if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, so I think um, the first two sections of the climate change section make a lot of sense. Um, 
had some concerns about the new management commitment sections, um, which is looking for applicants to, and I don't have it up. It is going to be page 26 of your workbook. Okay, thanks. 11 C um, is at the top. Of yeah. The so, <laughs> so asking, um, we're giving applicants the opportunity. So I realize it's not a requirement, but um, to incorporate riparian buffer management practices and restoration uh, practices, and then also a forever wild management regime. So, um, kind of. Concerns from two two perspectives. Um, one from thinking about um, the applicant who's who's thinking about these things. Um, these seem like a pretty big ask for for five points. Um, and I know um, we've been an applicant to the MNRCP program before. And I, I think the uh, link here was to kind of sync the riparian buffers with the MNRCP program and. They're pretty stringent and that's been an obstacle um, even for BPL in terms of thinking about management and using that as a funding source. So I, I worry about that being kind of pretty far down the spectrum. Um, and, you know, so it, it's a big lift. I worry from operating entities perspective, whether it would be worth the five points, right? They could just say, okay, well, we'll You just Lost muted. Time. We can't hear the room. You hear us now? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, You're going to have to just project. Oh, OK, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to repeat all that. But just thinking, I did see, I didn't realize that there was the choice to like uh, pick two of the three sections. But I think it still um, puts us in a challenging situation as an applicant. Um, and then from the DSA perspective, I guess I have concerns about how how it seems like gearing climate more towards um, an enforcement mentality rather than kind of encouraging a culture that that is um, ensuring that all of our projects are doing what they can to kind of make a difference with climate climate change. And um, I don't we don't have the capacity, nor do I really want to be out there like monitoring buffers on on an LMF property just because they, you know, thought that was a way to get five extra points on on the application. I think it's collectively our all of the LMF projects make such a meaningful contribution to climate change. And I it just it just seems a little too intense of a an approach. And from my FNW's perspective, I agree with um, everything that Liz had to say. I think we'd be challenged to work with an applicant to implement some of these things. I would prefer that there was an option. Well, I think these things are good. Um, it's just how they're implemented. And I would prefer if there was a management plan and applicants were talking about how they were going to address climate in their management plan, something that's adaptable. You know, we're still learning about climate adaptation. And um, I think it's tricky to be putting in, you know, specific requirements into a project agreement that aren't really amendable. Um, and if that could go into a management plan instead, we'd be reviewing those, you know, every few years and could really be working more dynamically with applicants on management for climate. Hey, you get a lot, you got a lot there. Thanks for that. So uh, I think those are important comments. Um, I think there are some substantial pieces to what staff is putting on the table for consideration. Um, I know I looked at these as, you know, at, at a much higher level, a more simplistic approach. Are you willing to do this, right? And that's how, when I read it, that's how I was like, are you, are you willing to go into that? I think but what Bethany just brought up about management plans, I think it almost seems to fit better into to a management plan. Um, Thoughts from the board on those comments. It might be helpful to hear from Matt, who was on the scoring committee and okay. had a had a pretty substantial role in coming up with these criteria. Matt, can we put you on the spot? Yes. <laughs> I honestly, I had not thought about 
it very much from the perspective of the DSA trying to enforce this, to, be, to tell you the truth. So that is a, that is an interesting uh, consideration for sure. And I'm not quite I'm not quite sure how to respond. I do feel, though, that there's, you know, we, you, you pay attention to the, to what's happening in the world. Uh, climate change is, a, you know, it's a huge existential sort of thing out there that uh, and for us to do um, nothing about it in terms of management decisions, which can have such profound effects on how much carbon gets stored or sequestered on a given track of land. I don't I, I don't know. It, it just doesn't feel uh, comfortable to me to uh, turn our backs on, on such an, an extraordinarily important issue. But I but it is also it's not only very important, it's very complicated. So how to wrestle with it? Um, well, you you have in front of you our best efforts to wrestle with it. Um, I will say that this will not be popular. I don't expect this position to carry the day, but the last of the four bullets, forever wild, is simple to implement and monitor. And I personally wouldn't lose sleep over um, giving that option alone, but that will be very unpopular in many circles. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to keep it. I'm going to keep it with the board here just for a second, yeah. Jim. Um, are you prepared to go to one of the other bullets? Yeah, I'd like to stick to the management. Yeah, I'd like we need to resolve this. These are fairly substantial comments, and we need to resolve this result. That would be preferable. Yeah. If we want to issue an RFP on an annual schedule. If we want to stick on stick to our schedule. Um. Barbara. And I was concerned about. This is really this is not a new it. concern. Like yeah. as we said, there was not entire consensus among the foreign committee, so we expected and I this conversation. I really want to get a call out. I don't think we should let this hold us up from getting a call out. But what I was going to say is, there are already two parts here that equal the ten points. So if we set aside this management commitment for more, you know, review. Um, it could still be incorporated, you know, in a future cycle. I'm very sensitive to what we're asking the DSAs to do. And we just talked earlier about the need for Commissioner Camuso and Commissioner Beal to try to get more staff uh, into the budget, which I think is going to be a hard sell. That's my opinion. Um, and so I think we have to really think about that. This is very intense in here. Yeah. And, you know, maybe as I think either Bethany said, we're still learning a lot about this. This this is all kind of new information here. The other two are pretty straightforward. And uh, Jennifer educated me on the maps that are available to, you know, determine if you're in a geophysical setting that needs to uh, have more conservation. So and climate resilience, we already know we have a tool that measures that. Yeah. So those two seem very workable to me. This seems like it's time. Needs a little massage. Needs a little bit more work and thought. Is, is the board comfortable with only having 10, 10 points associated with climate? I should clarify that only 10 points would be available for climate. Anyhow. Uh, anyhow, that's right. right. So, yeah, this is like you already have the three parts that can two, add up two, to the 10. Two that add to the 10. Um, good thought. Um, the board, Laura, what? what? Good question. <laughs> sorry. Oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah, I. I so could the management, I'm, I didn't, wasn't part of this, so if Lord knows, the management commitment, could that be something that we keep, but is evidenced by a draft management plan in the, and then keep it in the workbook, but that's how we define it? See, uh, there, that was just my yeah. thought. Okay. <coughs> that, may, that, 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 that may complicate it for some, for some managers. I think that, that is probably a good direction to head toward for the future. Yeah. Catherine? 
Yes, thank you. Um, I guess I will um, address what Mac had brought up, the uh, commitment to a forever wild management. While I certainly understand there's certain, you know, there's pieces of property that should be forever wild and get that designation. But to have that as an option as a management uh, for me for entire swaths of property, I have a, a large I have a huge problem with that because I really think when you're talking about carbon sequestration, you want to sustainably harvest and lock up that those forest resources into carbon, such as you know the wood paneling behind me. Um, versus if you do forever wild, you're allowing those forests to, whether it's forest fire or you know just degrade on the forest floor, you're releasing that carbon back in. Versus if you have sustainably harvested reforestation, that's your best way of locking up carbon. And now agree that uh, prescription is not perfect for every forest. Um, you do want to have some locked up, but as having that as an option that somebody could just default to get that as the five points, um, I've got some pretty big concerns with that. Thank you. Okay, thanks Catherine. Um, any other members of the board before I go quickly to the public? Amanda? I, I just would like to say I like Barbara's suggestion. Okay. Um, I think that this could use a little bit more work. Um, I, I'm not saying throw it all together, but I think for this round, we're not quite ready to articulate what the management commitment piece should look like. Okay. Um, we, we do have a member of the public that has their hands up, and I'm going to apologize because I cannot see your name from this distance across the room, but well, I'll. Jennifer. It's Jennifer. Hi, everybody. It's Jennifer Melville. Um, I was and I'm still working on behalf of OSI on this project, even though I no longer work with the Open Space Institute. Um, and I was really happy to be on the scoring committee. I just want to say on the stewardship piece, that is something we brought into OSI brought into our last regrant program around climate. And we were having we've had exactly the same conversation and debate that you all are having, and it is extremely, um, I don't think we all know yet. I think you're right, Barbara. We don't know yet the right approach, and this was our best thinking about it. I do think that when you have a conservation easement, it's much easier to put in commitments around you know, things that you might say, or you might defer them to a management plan that's part of the easement. That's pretty common, right? You say, we're gonna, <laughs> you froze, Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer. <laughs> okay. All Anyways, right. I think with the conservation easement process project, it can work. I think it's much trickier in a fee project. So um, I think maybe we need to we can spend more time on it with all of you. I think there's um, lots of different ways to get at this that aren't so burdensome. Um, but yeah, I think the conversation is one that you know. Just want to say I'm glad you're having it and uh, you're really on the very cutting edge of many, most funding entities aren't really thinking about this, but if we're going to be focused on climate, as Max says, how do we know when we protect a place with high climate values that those are going to persist in the future? And that's really important for the investment of LMF dollars. Okay. So thanks. All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, we, we, Jerry. Thanks. Um, I, I was on the scoring committee wearing sort of my land trust hat, and I will just say that I expressed the same concerns uh, to the committee that have been expressed today. And uh, yeah. so. great. All right. Thanks, Jerry. I, I think um, Barbara has an excellent out for us um, for now. Um, it, so the concept would be that we would take um, uh, under item 11, uh, 11C, I guess it's 11C, uh, the management commitments, that five points. So we would, we would take that out of the scoring document for now. Um, further work will need to be done on that. Um, I think the conversations around management plan and how they fit in the management plans could be part of that overall conversation. Um, but we still have the 10 points uh, associated with uh, climate. Are we comfortable with that approach? Great. All right. I think we've got resolution. Uh, thank you very much. So we're going to go over project inquiry form. This is another component of the workbook that saw significant uh, updates. And Jason is going to go through this really quickly. Yes, as quickly as I can. This is another piece that came out of that uh, process work group and was the subject of a lot of discussions between LMF and DSA staff. Uh, we are proposing a new uh, 
new process for this round, uh, or rather, but it's, I mean, new, new is not the right word, it's a consolidation of two processes that were happening in parallel before this. So up until now, the process has been that applicants were um, have, were responsible for going to the DSAs and seeking sponsorship. And simultaneously, they were they had to send a uh, preliminary project inquiry to LMF just to alert us of their interest and kick off that process. And what that resulted in was a lot of duplication of effort where they were having conversations kind of simultaneously with one of us, with Liz and with Bethany in some cases, all three of us. And we would have all have our own questions about the projects and give them, you know, sometimes conflicting information about how they should proceed. So what we are proposing is a single point of contact where the applicant uh, initiates their project by sending a the project the revised project inquiry form, and then LMF and DSA staff jointly review that and. Um, decide who the appropriate sponsoring agency is. Uh, you know, we saw that last round where one project changed sponsors during the board meeting. <laughs> so hopefully we can avoid those situations going forward. Uh, so to do to accomplish that, the um, there's more there's more information in the project inquiry form about uh, access readiness and management, uh, all of which is information that uh, the DSAs have been asking applicants for as part of their sponsorship decisions. So it's not information that LMF had been at asking for, but it's not new, a new burden on applicants. Um, also, just asking for the MNAP review to happen at that inquiry stage and asking for a best guess project budget for our own planning purposes. Uh, that and that is the uh, those are the changes to the inquiry form and the you know, quick overview of the process that we're looking at. And I would say this is responsive both to um, interest in LMF and DSA staff starting like three years ago. <laughs> and then um, as a result of um, recommendations made from the work group as well. So all kind of culminating in an update and gets back to this is the circle back to Commissioner Beale's comments from earlier, just in like consolidating processes, creating efficiency. Any issues, concerns, objections from the board on the project inquiry form? Seeing any, move along. Is there anyone? You got one more? Uh, it's like doing too many things at once. Appraisal standards. I think we can briefly just mention on this one. You adopted these standards in March 2022. So this is what we are talking about incorporating into the workbook. Um, we don't. I don't think we need to rehash all that, just that that will be incorporated. Um, and this is, um, I guess, before we go into this, any other thoughts or questions, I think, before we before we get off? We need to circle back to the stewardship. We question. do need to talk about stewardship. Um, I just won't give up on stewardship. I'd love I, to let this go, Pat. I think, I think my recommendation is that um, what I, what I hope we can accomplish is that the board um, conditionally approve the workbook and you will receive an updated version between now and the end of the week that will incorporate any edits we've talked about here, whether it's to the uh, scoring for climate and we will generate a proposal for how we will communicate about stewardship to our applicants so that we can incorporate that into our process, but still give us a little bit of flexibility in determining all the details. That way we don't put off giving out stewardship funds for another year. I, I don't know how the rest of the board feels, but I think we're going to have, we have to indicate something around stewardship um, through this process. So I, I, I like that concept. Is, is the uh, biggest outstanding issue just how we feel about the match at this point? I mean, I know we're yeah. going to do research. But that's a really important piece that for applicants, applicants to need yeah. to know. And can we can we just get a feel for how the board feels about um, whether you whether the applicant should put in funds into the endowment um, or whether they can just use excess land? So the options are 
require cash match or allow cash and or that land value. Those are kind of the two potential options. I right. think I think it would be helpful to hear where the board is at, but I think it would be good if the staff could come up with a couple of options that give you some flexibility as well. I just think the board didn't get a chance to weigh in whether they like the yeah. idea of you know, each of the parties, LMF and the applicant, creating this joint pool of cash that can then generate money, or if you prefer the option of excess land value, which adds nothing to the corpus. I think it's a really I mean, So to me, it depends clear. on too, whether it's just to the state agency, it's the state agency, or is it not? If it's to the state agency holding, using land for match to me isn't, my, my view isn't really going to benefit you guys, but, um, but it may if it's in the opposite direction. So I think I'd like to see a few examples myself. I'm not sure we've got enough to set this issue now, but I mean, Jim, you well, feel differently? To me, it's kind of a timing thing. I'm I'm more than in favor of the cash scenario, but if we're looking at a call for projects right away, and I think we're sort of going to blindside some people with that. If it, if, if we if require the cash, cash, only, right. cash only, but that doesn't mean that over time here for another round, we made it clear that this is going to be important because I, I would think some people would have a hard time accommodating that on a, you know, this short time frame. So. I hear you, and that's why I'm sort of suggesting we come back with a couple yeah. of options that yeah. give you yeah. some flexibility and yeah, I see. I know I'd like to. I know Mac, Catherine, would you like to see some options? Do you have a firm opinion? Options? I'm seeing a yes from Catherine. Mac, yes. Why don't we? Why don't we see a couple options? I I, I think I I think I don't necessarily disagree with you from a cash perspective from the benefit on on one side of that equation, but I think seeing some options might help us, and I, I think we can get through this. So that state agencies are a separate issue. We, we certainly need are different treatment. Exactly. More ways than one. Different treatment. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's sort of what I meant about flexibility. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Okay. All right. Um, so we will see a revised workbook with some options around stewardship. So Jason's effective will be satisfied. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll reflect the changes reflect. to the climate criteria. criteria. Okay. okay. And Sarah, I see that someplace it said December 2nd that. Yeah, I guess look at that. Someone else has mentioned that to me. That's supposed to be when, when the call goes out. What What is the process oh. from here? Perfect segue, Barbara. <laughs> um, the goal, yes, the the goal is to get the workbook firmed up in the next week. You know, but by this time next week, um, all of these changes that we've discussed here today will be approved by the board, and we can then issue a call for proposals. The schedule that we're looking at um, in talking with um, state staff and our applicant community, there was an interest in keeping. So you'll recall last year, we actually did three, but consolidating that down to two. So there's a single call for proposals for all projects, both statewide significance and community conservation projects. That's what would be issued in December. Those inquiry forms um, due January 13th, final proposals due March 24th, and then board scoring and selection um, in mid-May. We then also have a working forest projects round. This builds in flexibility for the, the state agency staff who are, have um, a, a big role in implementing um, our first call for proposals, but also those other projects that may want to come in later in the year. And we would mirror what we did last year. So May inquiry forms, Proposals in August and then September will be board scoring and selection. Are we going to go into some other areas here? I have some 
what I consider important questions to ask about the major land assets and the additional planning. Um, okay, um, we, we can back up and do that if you. Yeah, I just want to understand the, the single exceptional value piece. Sure. Um, there's land assets or single exceptional value, and so each one of them is 30 points. Right, but you only pick one. So if, if you pick single exceptional value and we don't agree with it, it's you lose the whole thing. I mean, we, we that seems like that. a pretty risky <laughs> move. We thought about that and um, incorporated as part of our inquiry form in Appendix A. We are asking folks, give us a heads up early on in your project if you're planning on um, requesting those single exceptional value. LMF DSA staff will kind of coach you on like, is this really rare to the state of Maine or to its region? And and um, also be thinking about your multiple values. And so there is definitely an intent to coach um, applicants on what um, category is most appropriate for their project. And, and that is consistent with what we've been and, doing anyway. And they have an opportunity down the road in the in the timeline to say, OK, I, I give out. Also, also uh, we're going to yeah. say the same thing. If they put in their proposal and say, we think we have a single exceptional value, and you all look at it and say it's not that exceptional, the, the, the workbook then says that you will go through and score it on the multiple land assets as best you can based on the information oh. that they've presented. Yeah, but so we thought about that. So, and the other question is the 30 points. We've had 20 in the past. Um, what? What drove that as far as single exceptional value? I understand it when it comes to land assets, but I don't when it comes to uh, single exceptional value. Why the allocation of 30 points? Yeah, it seemed uh, quite a boost. Um, that one I thought could have some impact really in the actual scoring when it got down to it. So was there a some motivation. I think it was a recognition that that if this is truly a single exceptional value, this is this is a phenomenal asset that the state of Maine should not pass up, and we want to reward those projects. Um, I, it was also an opportunity to we didn't want to disadvantage a single exceptional value by only getting twenty points when multiple values can get points. So it was in, an attempt to level the playing field regardless of which option you chose. You, you had equal equal points available to you. Okay. Roll well, on agree, I, but that's okay. Yeah, the, the wow factor. It is, yeah. it, that, yes. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's, you know, it directly comes out of statute. Yeah. It, it tells us that we must choose projects with either a single exceptional value or multiple values. And we didn't feel like we had guidance from from statute that one was more important than the other. They were equal. Okay. Um, Eric, could I just take a look again at uh, round B working fours? I, I was thinking we had something called working lands, and that was not only for forests, but it was working waterfront and it was agricultural lands. So, so uh, yep. So you're not those? wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is specifically about the CNR workbook. So I wanted to focus specifically on working forests. Okay. We know that um, the working farmlands is expecting to use that same schedule. Okay. Um, we, yeah. It doesn't sound like working waterfront will this time around. They're going to take a pass or at least wait it out for a while. Yeah. So you will likely see... Um, farmland and working forest on that same on that schedule. Page. Okay, thank you. If we resolve our staffing right now, we're still sharing people to make a whole person to run the program. Okay. All right. Do you have any other surprises for us today, Jim? <laughs> There's plenty of coffee. Can we go back to item one. I appreciate that. I don't know. Did you get? Did you bring that? Yeah. If you did, thank you very much. Yes. I did have one of these. Remind me of the same thing. So okay. So we've got a couple of things. I think we need. I I, I I need some kind of resolution from the board on. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that we 
need a specific motion for this particular board. If the board thinks I'm wrong, please feel free to jump in and make a motion. But we have, um, uh, we, we, we know we have a CNR round coming up. We've made these workbook changes. We've got some modifications to the workbook based on uh, based on the conversation today. Um, the dates, um, and then we've got some additional information coming in on stewardship some, with some examples. So I think we ought to see that um, uh, information and we can either, do, as long as we are comfortable with that, board members can respond by email with an affirmative, this looks good, um, and we can capture that, um, uh, capture that in the in the minutes. Does that sound all right? Sounds great. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, let's move on then to the calendar. Okay. Calendar. Holy crap. <laughs> yeah. No. Right. <laughs> Uh, we really like the AOC. I know. I just give you guys giant pass on the back it's after looking. And then resignate. I think it's time for a little swamp. Yeah. Thirty-seven projects coming down the pike. <laughs> They're going to be busy. I'll trade you whales. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a fair trade. <laughs> Um, I did um, have one board member indicate a conflict um, with September. Um, and September is a date when we will be scoring those working uh, forest projects and making allocations for farmland and um, forest projects. So um, no, uh, September 28th or October 3rd, I think what I'm going to do is just send this around by email and get people to confirm which of those two are best. And then we will um, post these to our website so folks can know. Yeah, we will know better in late December, January, what committee uh, Times. committee date will be to, yes. from a legislative perspective. So. Fine tuning. Yeah. Can can we as an AOC make do have you yeah, all we need changes to, to talk the about that a little bit before we sure you we, we can do that. <laughs> I'd like to change that. <laughs> the um the, I would say the goal of the AOC meetings is to have enough AOC meetings spaced between board meetings so that projects can come come in, get approved, and then voted on by the board. So that's what we're trying to maintain is. Plenty of opportunity for appraisals to get approved by the board. So to be confirmed by email and then posted to the LMF website. Okay. All right. Can I go? Go. I'll be back. Yeah, 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 this is like you you to talk as fast as that diagram. I will I, the point of this is to illustrate it's complicated. You don't need to study this diagram. This is our jumping off point for the software you've helped us uh, acquire. To help us manage the grants application process. So that's our jumping off point. Next slide. Here is the screen that applicants look something very much like this when they apply on our online portal. And it looks a lot like this. Next slide. And here is the screen the applicants will see when they when they are being greeted in and welcomed into the process. Welcome. And this we use public access for main waters as our as our sort of test to begin. It's not final yet, but um, we wanted to focus on that because those projects can come in on a rolling basis and we kind of wanted to soft open we like the idea of a soft open. Um, but we hope to have this in place for you can go to the next screen, Sarah. We hope to have this in place very, very soon. There will be multiple review portals, so this will be a way you guys get to see things, a way for LMF and DSA staff to collaborate. The appraisal review committee will be a oversight committee, excuse me, appraisal oversight committee will be able to see things also um and access improvement grant applications all of this and we are very much looking forward to this entire setup every single one of us on staff next slide <laughs> and it has been it's not, not been easy the point of this is so that you all know we've not been sleeping in the background while you've spent this and we thank you so so very much for investing in this leap into the future the only thing i would add is that there is a possibility that we will have this um program up and running and the the um, issues 
I wouldn't say for that. For the <laughs> working forest. <laughs> for the working forest round. So putting that out there to let people know that is a goal that we have. We will see if we make it. There's still a lot of work to do, but yeah. So you will do thorough vetting and exactly. testing. testing. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. We won't make you do <laughs> so easy for you all to use. Yeah. And that's what they Okay. Last thing, biennial report starting at two o'clock today. LMF staff are going to turn all of their attention to preparing the biennial report for you all, which we will um, have at the January board meeting and needs to be adopted by the board and submitted to the legislature. So that's that's the <clears throat> next big push for staff. I think this goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. We talked a lot about the fact that uh, the money that we're spending is a general fund contribution for the town. So I think uh, some, some extra emphasis on, on that particular piece uh, and the importance of that will be incredibly, incredibly important for this report. So, uh, without saying that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Next AOC meeting, you guys can change it if you want. I do, you know, we've been kidding around a lot about the AOC meeting at the AOC at the group, but I can tell you, um, you have made the rest of the board's role work here um, easier. The AOC is um, a lot of burden goes to the three of you for the work that you're doing. The war, and, and I've been on this board now for 12 years. Um, and the AOC is working better now than it ever has uh, in the program's history. So I want to thank you all for the work that you're doing. Um, and then the next board meeting is January 24th. And if there are, Robert, we'll be and, uh, and that's what I'm looking for. So, uh, we have a motion to adjourn, seconded by Mr. Burley. Uh, all in favor say aye, aye. No, way to go. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Merry Christmas, folks. Merry Christmas, folks.